As intros go, this is perhaps one of the strangest ones. The reason behind this video existing, the catalyst behind its creation, goes all the way back to December 2015 and the death of Lemmy. Chances are that anyone watching this will be aware of who Lemmy was, but just in case anyone out there missed out, here's a quick potted history from his Wikipedia page. Lemmy was known as the founder, lead singer, bassist, primary songwriter and only continuous member of the British heavy metal band Motorhead. The band's success peaked around 1980 or 81 with the hit single Ace of Spades and the chart-topping live album No Sleep Till Hammersmith. OK, with everyone now on the same page, where do I and this video fit into this story? Well, in the modern day and age, whenever anyone famous passes away, you tend to hear about it through social media. And it was the same for me when Lemmy died. There was a tweet, I clicked on the article and read the obituary and followed through to a couple of other articles, and my eye was drawn to one particular photo that accompanied one of those. It was this one. It showed Lemmy backstage reading a newspaper, but next to him was an unusual-looking slot machine. And it was this one picture that set me off down a path that leads directly to this YouTube video over five years later. I'll explain why. For years I've been fascinated with gambling machines. For me it's not really all about the gambling, it's, it's that I'm interested in the various ways the machines work. And as a result, as well as playing on them quite a bit in my younger days in arcades, I've also owned quite a few machines over the years. I had a machine just like this one here when I was in my teens and it took up a corner of a room in my parents' house. I don't think they were too impressed with that. But in recent years I've owned Japanese Pashinko and Pashislo machines and a few years ago I achieved one of my dreams by getting a, a fully restored Jennings Governor mechanical one arm bandit. Now I should mention just for clarity it's really these older style of machines that we might refer to in the UK as one arm bandits. The more modern push button devices, we tend to call those fruit machines, or slot machines, or slots. Those are, the, of course, the same names used in the US, but over here we might also call them fruities. As in, I've got a pocket full of shrapnel, I've just won on the fruities. But there are other names as well. So, with that cleared up, let's just go back to that Lemmy picture again. So to me, this was an unusual type of fruit machine of a sort I hadn't seen before, so I wanted to learn more about it. Now, I managed to find another higher quality picture, and you can see when I compare them side by side that it's exactly the same device. So this colour picture, let me read the text on it a little bit easier, and I could see that it looked like it was German. So I checked and popped it in a translator and confirmed that yeah, it was German. So now a quick translation the other way from English slot machine brings up the German Spielautomat, or sometimes Geldspielautomat. Geldspielautomat. A search for one of those terms on German eBay brings up a variety of machines that look similar to the one in the picture with Lemmy. And all of these look different to anything I'd encountered before. A category of slot machine that I'd never seen. Now, I haven't been inside a normal slot machine arcade for quite a few years, but from my occasional visits to casinos on cruise ships, I've noticed significant changes in the type of machines they've got installed over the last decade or so. It's all giant video screens now, with fewer and fewer devices based around mechanical reels. Many of the new machines seem to originate in China, so my observations here are primarily talking about the previous generation of more mechanical devices, from the 80s and 90s, perhaps into the noughties, the ones that I remember the best. And as far as that generation of machines went, you could always identify which country a device came from just by the way it was configured. Now remember, these are generalizations. There are always exceptions to these things. But if I described the average machine from the era, it would go like this. The machines from the US weren't floor standards. They were therefore put on pedestals. However, they were quite wide and tall with a big marquee section often showing the payout chart at the top. The games had quite basic interactivity with the player often just choosing the stake and how many lines were going to be activated. Most machines would offer multiple win lines. Meanwhile, in the UK, the machines here were floor standards. There was usually only one win line, but the game offered more interactivity, the ability to hold reels as well as nudge them, which imparted some degree of strategy to the player. Memorising the layout of reels might give a player an advantage by knowing which ones to nudge, which symbols were out of reach. And meanwhile, over in Japan, the machines there were smaller, 
I'd only use tokens. The three buttons below the reels look like the UK's hold or nudge buttons, but neither of those are features on the Japanese ones. Instead, the three buttons manually stop the reels. The payouts from the Japanese machines are capped at very low amounts, but the incentive to play was enhanced by the chance of activating many multiple repeats of the previous payout. And now there's this fourth type of machine I wanted to try for myself. So as you can see from that, the machines sold in various countries were quite different from one another. You wouldn't, for example, mix up a US slot machine with a UK fruit machine. They are quite distinctive in their designs. And yet that's despite the fact they all start really at a common point of origin with the mechanical one-armed bandits like my Jennings Governor. So why do they look so different? Well, part of the reason must be because the machines sold, say, within the UK were made in the UK. The US ones were made in the US. There was very little cross-pollination over the years. So the manufacturers start going off in a different direction. The customers within that country get used to those kind of machines. The manufacturers iterate on those machines. And really, we end up with completely different looking machines over time, despite kind of starting off in the same point. But there was another kind of gambling machine that was a bit of a rival to the mechanical one arm bandit at one point. I've got one over here. Let me just go and get it. Neck. This is an all-win. In the UK, these had been around since the 1890s. They worked off an old penny. They were still being manufactured up into the 1960s, but the newer electromechanical one arm bandits of the time, as well as decimalization in 1971, ultimately did them in. Now, there were many different machines that came in cabinets of this design, but this is a, a kind of typical game. You put your coin in the top, a silver ball appears at the bottom, and the idea is that you flick that ball around using this spring-loaded lever and hopefully land it in one of the win positions up here. If you miss that, it goes down the loose hole there. So let's have a go, see if we can get it to work. It's a, a little bit warped inside this, unfortunately. Oh, there we go, we've won. So that's two, so I'll just twist my thing here, and I get two pennies back for the one that I put in. Now, I've had this thing since uh, I was perhaps six years old, although, of course, it dates back earlier than that. I think this is from perhaps the 1950s. But the reason I mention this particular device is that these were also very popular in Germany in the early part of the 20th century. And it seems to me like the design of those machines that they had later owes a lot to these. The dimensions are roughly along the same lines. Well, at least they are on the earlier machines. As time went on, they tended to get larger and deeper. But I kind of get the feeling that it was these that dictated the machines that came later. Perhaps one of these was on a wall in a bar, and then you want to replace it with something new, but you don't want like a floor standing one or something on a pedestal. So they designed a machine that would roughly fit within the same place and then over time of course those then developed now the later ones are quite a bit larger and heavier but still it seems like this is the point of origin for that design whereas in the uk we just moved away from these we kind of dropped them moved on to electromechanical one arm bandits and these floor standing fruit machines now one thing i will say about these is that if you want a machine like this in the uk there is a company still making them they're able to sell these direct to the public because they're classed as swp skill with prizes and that means that the user has some say so over whether or not they win whereas a machine that you just press a button and it's random well those are classed as awp amusement with prizes and those come into a different category entirely and generally you'd have to have a gaming license to be able to have one of those machines but these you could have with modern day currency you could have one in the comfort of your own home and you could even have your own graphics put on the back panel there i'll put a link to the company in the description but yeah these machines definitely seem to me to have something in their kind of DNA that then was carried on into the later machines that became popular within Germany, but not in the UK. But for the moment, let's go back in time now, four or five years ago, I'd just discovered the existence of the different machines they had in Germany, and I was trying to get hold of one for myself. And back then, just like now, you could look on eBay.de and you'll find plenty of machines for sale. But just like back then, none of the sellers were prepared to ship them internationally. They'd only sell them within Germany. 
And I fully understand why that is. I mean, these machines are big, bulky, and very heavy. Difficult things to ship, especially considering they've got a large glass front on them. The chance of something like that getting damaged in transit is very high. And I can understand why someone would be reluctant to ship it for that reason alone. But on top of that, there's all sorts of rules about selling gambling machines on eBay. And they've changed those rules so many times over the years that it's very hard to follow. On top of that, the German seller selling something to someone in the UK would need to know all about the UK rules. And those are extremely complicated. So much so that many of the retailers on eBay in the UK who used to sell decommissioned gambling machines here here, locally, are even unable to sell them now. There's rules about having licenses to sell these things, as well as the person who buys them having a gambling license themselves. It's just extremely complicated, and I'd understand entirely why someone just wouldn't want to get involved in it. So, for the moment, let's return back to Lemmy and his German gambling machine, because there's more to tell. Initially, I'd assumed that these pictures were taken at the same location, perhaps different shows at different times, but the same dressing room. It turned out, though, that one picture had been taken in Glasgow, whereas the other one was in Birmingham. So then I watched the documentary all about Lebby, and that same slot machine turned up again, but in yet another location. However, this time it had gained a motorhead sticker over the word cup but it's definitely the same machine. And notice how Lemmy has the keys to the machine too. So now I was even more intrigued. Initially I thought this must have been an old machine that had perhaps been left behind in a dressing room in Glasgow for some reason, maybe to entertain touring artists or take a bit of money off them. But now it's clear that it's Lemmy's own machine and it was put in his dressing room before each show. So now I decided to see how many photos I could find of Lemmy with his slot machine. And while there weren't any more of that one, there were quite a few pictures stretching back years of him with various different machines. And the connection doesn't just stop there. The story goes that Lemmy, whose real name was Ian, acquired the nickname Lemmy because he was always pestering people to Lemmy a quid so he could put it into a fruit machine. Lemmy himself can't remember the origins of his name, but this seems plausible a reason as any as to why he was called that. But one other question I've got is, why these German machines? Well, I think it's just down to size. If you wanted to have a slot machine follow you around to different locations, the German ones are the easiest ones to transport. I'm not saying, though, that they're easy. They are heavy, they're quite large. But then again, Lemmy had one of those jobs, one of the few jobs where he was able to get large things carted around with him to different locations. After all, that's what roadies are for. But yeah, they're definitely not something that you'd want to carry around on your own. It's more of a, a two-man job. In fact, I just want to show you something. Ah, my fingers. Oh, I think I've done my legging. Yeah, I got one eventually. It was back in 2018. It was over two years after I'd first seen that picture. Unfortunately, it's an older model from the 1980s. Not exactly what I wanted, but it was the only one from anyone who was prepared to export it. I think it came from a general antiques dealer rather than someone who resold slot machines as a business. So they probably weren't following all the rules and didn't mind shipping it over to the UK. OK, let's plug it in. Now, this particular machine is made by a company called Nova. The model is the Triumph, and I believe it dates back to 1987. So it's an older style of machine. And these older machines often had this kind of layout where you've got wheels rather than the reels that we're more familiar with nowadays. But it's the same idea. You've got five circles here. And if you get three matching symbols, once those wheels have spun, that sit within those five circles, then you've won. I think this wheel design was perhaps to keep the machines slimmer. And over time, of course, the machines have got quite a bit larger and therefore there was no need to carry on doing this. But this was a, 
supposed to be a, a wall mounted machine. I don't know if you can see here, but there are these lugs on the back, similar to what you might get on like a smart TV nowadays to, so you could lift this up and over and hang it off brackets on the wall. But one thing with this, that's the same with all of these German machines that I've seen, is the fact that unlike perhaps Japanese, but especially US and UK machines, there's no fruit to be seen on here anywhere. There's a couple of symbols, but the rest of it is monetary amounts. Yeah, we have no bananas, although we didn't really have bananas on the normal fruit machines anyway. But yeah, no fruit on your German slot machines. Now to any German viewers, something like this would be very familiar, but to me seeing one for the first time, it's a little bit confusing. For example, we've got a start button here and then two stop buttons. In the UK, we'd just have a start over here and we'd have three hold buttons, which might also double up as nudge buttons on some machines. And then to either side, we've got a gamble button. We've got these risk ladders here, either side, and those start off at zero. That's obviously if you're gambling here and then you lose, it goes to zero. But we've got fennigs at this point because this predates euros. So you could perhaps start at 20, 30, 40, 60, 80. So you're gambling here, you're getting up to a maximum of 260, two Deutsche Mark 60 Fennigs. But then up here we've got numbers. And underneath these, these are like special games. I'm, I was going to pronounce it then, but I'm not even going to attempt it. No, go on there. Sonderspiel games. These seem to be ones where you've got more chance of winning. So yeah, all very unfamiliar to someone who's used either US or Japanese or UK slot machines. But then again, there's some things that are familiar. You try to match symbols up as well. So you'd be able to understand it. But um, let me just show you inside this as well. Okay, here's the cash box, empty at the moment. And then this top section swings open. So I'd imagine a more modern machine would look very different to this, but this is all very 1980s. You can see here how those flat wheels make the front part of this really quite slim and there's a lot of space inside. We've got the three motors here for the spinning wheels and then under there's a load of different lights for all the different things that could be highlighted on the front. Of course our money goes in here but after it's gone through there it then passes into the coin mechanism here and at the bottom it's split off into the various different denominations. At the back that's the main computer section there, the brains behind the operation and there's various LEDs on there to indicate the status of things but really quite a bit of empty space in there beyond the front door. So if you were to get a smaller coin mechanism, you could make this thing quite a bit thinner than it is. Right, now I've turned it off so I'm able to mess around inside. So the coin mech here, when your coins go in the top, they fall down here, go into these tubes at the bottom. But of course, once you've got one of these machines, you need to make sure that there's enough money in it to be able to pay out. So you have to be able to fill up these tubes. And the way you do that is to lift this entire mechanism up and forward and then that gives you access to the coin tubes. And there's a slot in the top of each of these that enables you to feed the appropriate coins in. There's a speaker there with a adjustable volume on for the various different noises the device makes. That's really it. I mean, I don't really know what else I could say. So I best just close this up now. I just had to unplug it. <laughs> the smoke coming out of the top, which gets me onto the the next issue here. One of the reasons that I delayed this video so much after buying the machine back in 2018 was that I planned on getting together a load of Euro coins so I could demonstrate it properly. I wanted to show it paying out. Part of the problem that went with that though was that Bureau de Change don't hand out coins. You can only really get those within the country. You can get notes but you can't get coins. So my plan was over the holidays that followed getting hold of this, I was gonna keep hold of any euros I picked up while I was abroad. Well, I got quite a few back in 2019, but not really enough for a proper demonstration. So I thought I'll get some in 2020 when I go on a holiday then. Well, of course, that didn't come to pass for rather obvious reasons. And now uh, 2021, it's not gonna happen either. So I got to the point where I thought, well, I'm never going to be able to demonstrate this machine properly. So I'll just try and do it with the coins that I've got. So that's why I've got it out of my storage locker now to demonstrate in this video. But there's just one problem. It doesn't work. 
and it really doesn't work now with smoke coming out of it but you might have seen the flashing light before that was there to show that it thought it had been tampered with in some way and unfortunately that meant that it was uh, just completely unresponsive you put coins in they just go through drop out of the bottom again now it did work when I first got it delivered and it has been stored since then in a nice dry climate controlled environment but after I got it out and it wasn't working of course I went through all the basics I've removed deoxed and reseated every connector I found it had a dead lithium backup battery which was a double A size one but three and a half volts. I managed to source a replacement for that but it didn't help. The various LED indicators on the computer section all report back that there's no faults. Over the course of a few days I spent many an hour poring over it but at that time there were no obvious issues. It just refused to work. Clearly now though at least one capacitor is going to need replacing since I assume that's what just went up in smoke so I'm going to go on to replace those but as it is today here and now it's not working and I don't know when or if I'm going to be able to get it functioning properly. So as it stands, this was going to be the most disappointing end to a video ever. Five years in the planning, only to fall at the last hurdle. All I really wanted to do was give a bit of a demonstration as to how one of these things works. It wasn't really going to take all that long. It was just going to be a, a few minutes at the end of the video. But without that, the whole thing seems incomplete. But then I had an idea. You know how when an actor dies before a film's being completed, and they'll try and work around it somehow. They might use body doubles or rearrange certain scenes, rewrite the script, but also employ the use of computers to maybe cover over for the bits that the actor isn't there, using some CGI, perhaps stick someone's face on someone else, that kind of thing. Well, that gave me the idea that I could perhaps finish this in the virtual domain. And sure enough, there was a chap in Germany who's made a Geldspiel Automat simulator so i'm going to be able to demonstrate how one of these things works not this one but something very similar so let's have a look this machine is roughly the same as mine yeah it's a different model but it has the same features we've got three wheels here with windows on them the symbols that appear in those windows if three of them match then you win that amount well, you almost do, because you could collect it, or you could gamble it. One thing that I notice with these machines in particular, these are incredibly efficient at taking your money off you, and can be a completely hands-off experience after you've put your money in. Now watch what happens, as soon as I put a five in, it'll start spinning, without me doing anything at all. So we've got five credit over there, and we're already down to 470 now. So all it remains for me to do now, as far as... Uh, a gambler goes is just to sit back and watch this machine now i've won something there look it's stopping on a number oh 40. It's, i'm not pressing anything here it's collected it this is the last spin and it's taken all that money off me and I didn't press any buttons at all. Yeah, there we go, that's the end of that. Now, I don't know if you've noticed these three buttons along the bottom here and wondered what the purpose of them is, because you don't have to press any of them. I think this is quite likely a hold back to early rules about these things being skill-based games. Similar thing with the uh, pinball tables in America. You might remember the court case about that being a skill-based game or a game of chance. A similar thing with the Pashislo machines in Japan, how those have a stop for each reel. Therefore, you can class it as a skill-based game, even though you've got no hope of winning by pressing them. But let me just demonstrate what I mean with this one. We'll put a coin in here, and it'll start spinning. Just watch when the lights on these buttons light up. So that one's lit there, and then that one, and then finally this one will light up. So those are the points where I could have pressed those buttons. So let's press them this time so when start lights up i'm going to press it there that starts the first reel again and i could have stopped that one if i'd have been on time but i could stop that one early as well so you can restart the first one and you can stop the second two manually so let's do that again this time start that one again stop that one now 
and finally stop that one it's not giving you any greater chance of winning but it just gives you the ability to have some kind of manual control over it so let's put a five deutsche mark coin in there and hopefully i'll get into one of these modes where i can gamble a little bit and we'll see if i'm able to increase my winnings at all yes 360s right brilliant now i can press something oh and i've lost it all now while it's taking my money off me i'll try and explain what happens if you do win it seems to pick an amount of money it plays a little tune dances around down here somewhere and in theory it could land on any of these amounts of money at the bottom now once it's picked an amount of money you can then gamble that up or down or lose the lot so there's like two gambling stages here really one is to get the amount of money to start with and then to decide whether or not you want to risk that amount of money for the potential of a higher reward but here we go 40 let's see what this does i'm not going to press anything so see where it stops right it stopped at 80 that's good what's going to happen now it's gambling it oh it's gone up right and it's collected it so i've got 160 there so yeah, did absolutely nothing there at all. No hands-on button pressing whatsoever. That whole process was automated. So you get the idea as to how this machine works there. This is really what I wanted to show you on the other one. You're seeing much the same thing here, although it's a virtual version. Okay, so as you can see, this is a more modern design from the graphics, the overall layout of it, and the fact it's got a note taker at the top left there as well. Although, despite the fact this has more traditional reels on it rather than wheels, it does function in much the same way. Just like the previous model, this one is completely capable of working automatically without the need for any input at all from the user other than the money that they put in at the beginning. And it's happy just to work its way through that money until it's all gone. And I'd imagine that the machines that Lemmy used to carry around with him and put in his dressing room, those would have worked off uh, free play mode, more than likely. I mean, why have something that you have to put money in all the time and then take the money out of the cash box at the bottom at the end once you've lost it? So, yeah, I'd imagine they probably just spun their way through games like this is doing at the moment, or maybe they just fed it with a load of money at the beginning and let it gamble for a, a couple of hours until he switched the thing off. And for some reason, that must have given him some level of comfort it must have been something that was familiar to him the sounds of an arcade the spinning of the reels it was something that perhaps took him back to younger days and something that he found comforting to have in the background i'm not too sure i mean i'm just surmising here but you've got to wonder why you'd want to cart around your machine to various different locations one that you could never really win or lose anything on So there you go, that's the story of Lemmy and the Gelschbild Automat. I'm sure I'm getting a little bit closer each time. But yeah, it's a story that started for me over five years ago with the passing of a rock legend and ended up here and now in my garage with the death of this slot machine. Perhaps I shouldn't complain now because it's now a story that has a, a good arc to it. But anyway, that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.